as a reflexively trained sociologist, I find that it's important for myself to disclose some of the institutions and the places that have made me who I am and in turn influenced my work dramatically. I find that it's also important to know the same types of things about your audience. Uh, so how many people here are either from California or flew here from California for this event? Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> Um, well, I have a confession and some bad news. Uh, the research I'm about to share with you, um, even, even though I love living in California, this research indicates that California may not be the center of the universe. Um, <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really sorry and I'm dumbfounded, but I, I think that we may actually need to look beyond California if we want to have our fingers on the pulse of innovation. And uh, when I say look farther than California, I'm not just talking about coming to New York for a couple days. Um, so let me start with where I was born, Stanford Hospital, in the proverbial uh, epicenter of innovation, Silicon Valley. I grew up there uh, thinking that it was, in many ways, the center of, of the world. I went to Mountain View High School. Uh, I graduated in 1999, the same year that Google moved in to Mountain View. And then I went to college in Berkeley. And I ended up, because of this mix of Silicon Valley and the entrepreneurial spirit and the geekiness there and the political activist zeal of Berkeley, becoming kind of a, a strange person, um, I became a vegetarian quickly at Berkeley, then a vegan, then a rabid environmentalist. And then something weird happened. I got a job at this place, uh, the White House. I worked at the Council on Environmental Quality and later the Office of Management and Budget during the last six months of the Clinton administration. It was amazingly educational, but also really depressing. Um, I, I knew I could, t I could tell from the notes that he made and the margins of the reports that we did that Bill Clinton actually cared about climate change and wanted to do something. But he couldn't get the Kyoto Protocol signed. He couldn't get any real meaningful action to be taken. And I, I was left not sure what to do, not sure where to go. I, I'd been in the center of the world in California. I'd been at the heart of power at the White House. And so I decided I needed to look elsewhere. I shifted my focus south and I went to Brazil. Uh, this is the University of Sao Paulo where I went as a Rotary Scholar and got a master's degree in sociology and spent about three years enmeshed in Brazil activist networks, getting to know policymakers, and I met some of the smartest, most innovative, and most passionate people that I've ever met who were deeply committed to changing the world in, in real ways. Then I got a call from someone at this place, the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto. Uh, now, when I was first thinking about going to work at the Institute, I asked one of my heroes, Larry Lessig, what he thought about it, and he told me something I'll never forget. The best part of the Institute for the Future is its past. Um, now, that sounded kind of like a veiled insult at first, right? Um, but then when you start to think about it, it's actually quite true. This is a diagram from 1964 from one of our founders, Paul Barron, about distributed communications. He was really exploring the ways that people can communicate 50 years ago in a way that still informs so much of the thinking that we do today. Now, this gave birth to this org chart. It's, it's not not a tree like many organizations have that you may be used to, it's a spiral. At the center of that spiral is our executive director, who we also call lovingly our decision maker of last resort. The executive director reports to a lead team. The lead team uh, kind of spins out into the spiral, into the different programs, and this is the nexus in which the Governance Futures Lab was born two years ago at IFTF, uh, or the Institute for the Future. Now, um, the Governance Futures Lab came out of a desire that we had to take this, um, the, all of the innovation that's happening in Silicon Valley and really channel that into thinking about the future of governance. Now, a lot of people actually come to the Institute for the Future really from all around the world thinking that we have the recipe to the secret sauce for innovation. They, they think we kind of know it. Some people ask to see the crystal ball, and, and I show them. Um, but anyway, it's, uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty exciting place to be. Um, but what I was finding is that I couldn't find all the answers there. So um, now we're leaving the American sector. Now I'm curious, just to be fair, uh, who in the room here actually came here today um, from somewhere outside the US or identifies as from somewhere outside the US? Oh, also a lot, competing with California, wow. Um, so before I can explain exactly what leapfrog democracies are, I'm going to tell you about leapfrog technologies. You may be familiar with this. I'll go a little quickly. Um, this is a pile of cell phones in Senegal. So Senegal basically leapfrogged landline phones. They have less than uh, three, le 
landline phones for less than 3% of the population, uh, but now they have more cell phones than people in Senegal. It was a quick leapfrogging of, of an older technology, and actually when the cell phones got into use in Senegal, they were using a more advanced technology for their cell phone network than the biggest cell phone networks in the United States at the time. Steel is another interesting ingredient in technological leapfrogging. You can see that over about 4,500 years, we didn't make a lot of progress in terms of building really tall buildings. Um, but then, in the middle of the 20th century, uh, mass-produced steel, uh, steel became more and more accessible, and then a surprise happened. Um, countries like Malaysia, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, that weren't previously known as pioneers in building really tall buildings, built some really tall buildings, taller than any others in the world, and that was a leapfrogging. Um, with carbon nanotubes, who knows what's, uh, what's happening next in terms of the, the future of architecture. Now, legacy systems are the flip side of leapfrog technologies. Legacy systems can be things like uh, Lotus 123, which actually, believe it or not today, the um, successor to Lotus 123, which is IBM Notes, is still generating about a billion dollars a year for IBM. And it's because in many ways people are stuck in the legacy of the system that they've had for decades. The space shuttle is another example of a legacy system. It's, it was basically using 1970s era technology, but we couldn't get away from it because we'd been so deeply invested in it. Now, the hanging chad is what I would call another legacy system. Now, this is the bridge between the technology legacy systems and the political legacy systems, because it's kind of both. Um, the US Constitution, while it is an incredible asset to our democracy here in the United States, in many ways creates another type of legacy system. It makes it a little hard when we want to do things like update our laws about guns, or maybe update our laws about campaign finance, or, um, you know, update our electoral system. The Electoral College, we've all heard all the arguments against it, but going even further beyond that, let's think about why we have these four-year terms that we're actually, that, that, that a decision to make the terms for our presidency um, four years were made more than 200 years ago, and that wasn't just a political or philosophical decision, it was also based on a cost-benefit analysis of how often we could afford to take a poll. 200 years ago, right? If we were redesigning the system today, would we do it a little bit differently? Would we think differently about how often the government of the country would directly interact with, with constituents? So that's what brings me to leapfrog democracies. Um, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. Uh, this is a, a, a common Zen quote, but I think this captures a lot of the leapfrog democracy essence. So Mohammed Bouazizi from Tunisia is known as uh, the person who really kicked off the Arab Spring. Uh, three years later, after, uh, after that, Tunisia is now being heralded as having a constitution that's significantly more progressive than the US Constitution in four major ways, um, in terms of uh, workers' rights, women's rights, protection of the environment, and access to health care. Being written into the Constitution isn't the same thing as being real, but it's a definitely an important step. Estonia, or Estonia, as you may know it, um, they unselfconsciously market themselves that way, is actually the first country in the world to offer, offer full internet voting for all of their citizens uh, through an electronic ID card like this one. They started in 2005, and it actually has shown, uh, been very successful in increased voter turnout. Arena Electoral is a Mexican initiative to actually take um, policy proposals from all of the major four uh, presidential candidates in the 2012 elections in Mexico and uh, erase the names of who's writing the policy proposals, distribute them to three or 400 experts in Mexico and get um, blind, essentially blind taste tests about the, the policy programs of these officials and then rank them and then match voters to the people who they would be most suited to. This is something we haven't really done here in the US. Um, now, this is Ecuador, another of what I would call the epicenters of leapfrog democracies. Uh, in 2008, Ecuador's constitution was the first constitution in the world to recognize the legal rights of nature. In 2010, Bolivia, the, Ecuador's neighbor, passed a law making a similar change. Now, this has huge implications if you're thinking about things like climate change, not just in terms of how it affects humans, but how it affects our whole natural environment. 
Ecuador has another initiative that I'm really excited about that actually Mika tipped me off to last year. Um, it's called the Flock Society, Free, Libre, Open Knowledge Society. And it's a massive undertaking um, built on the indigenous uh, Ecuadorian concept of sumac yachay, uh, the knowledge society, or in Spanish, the procomun abierto. And it's bringing together these indigenous beliefs around knowledge sharing with a ethic of open source, commons-based thinking and innovation. And and it's actually making a series of pretty wide-ranging policy recommendations for how Ecuador can become the world's first commons-based society. Think of a nationally mandated and encouraged uh, sharing society, sharing economy. Ecuador um, brought together the world's experts in this field and is now holding a conference to evaluate the, res uh, the impacts of this research and where to go from there. This is a friend of mine in Brazil, Pablo Hortelado. He's a public policy professor in Sao Paulo, and he is actually in the process of rewriting the copyright rules for Brazil. He had an idea that file sharing was actually a very efficient way of getting movies and music and other kinds of files from one person to another. It's, it's actually really efficient. Um, he thought, oh, what if we just monitor who's downloading what, how many times, we put a tax on ISPs, internet service providers, and then we distribute that tax to whoever gets their stuff downloaded proportionally. It could stimulate a whole creative economy. It's a radical but I think brilliant proposal, and he's working on doing that. Now that's a lot easier to push for when you're in Brazil a country that has deliberately broken the patents on AIDS drugs to save lives, and also a country that's outside of the jurisdiction of the Motion Picture Association of America or the Recording Industry Association of America. Now I want to come back to New York. Um, who knows where the current participatory budgeting system um, in, in New York, some, I'm assuming a lot of you are familiar with this, it's a way that people from the city can interact with and make decisions about the city's budget. Who knows where this originated? Brazil, yes, and who knows when? Tw I heard 20, 25 years ago, 1989. It took two and a half decades for this innovation in Brazil, participatory budgeting, to make its way here to New York. Um, and this is a map of the more than 1,500 cities around the world that are now doing participatory budgeting. So tomorrow, I'm, I'd like to invite all of you to join me, as, as Mika mentioned, for a special session where we're going to bring the Social Inventors Toolkit from the Governance Futures Lab at the Institute uh, to you. It's a toolkit that we designed to create a process for governance design for the future. And this is your opportunity, if you've ever been interested in thinking about how to redesign the United Nations framework, um, how to maybe rewrite a new mandate for the NSA, design a governance structure for Mars, um, these are some of the questions we're going to be addressing tomorrow, and I'd love for you to join me. Now, going back to this concept of leapfrog democracies, I think it's important to ask why should we really care about this? Now, I, I grew up in a place in Silicon Valley and, and currently live in California and in the United States where we tend to think that all the innovation, all the newest stuff really does happen here in, our, in, in my city, in our country, and in many ways that's actually disadvantageous to us. And I think we have this incredible opportunity in front of us in this age of global communication, global knowledge sharing, to start looking to other places and to look beyond uh, not just Silicon Valley, but beyond New York, beyond Washington DC, beyond Brussels. And I think that it also means that we have a mandate to innovate in, in new ways, in op with open collaboration, using open source technologies, and really sharing those ideas with people from around the world. The moral of the story for me is that you really never know who you might learn something from. Thank you. <laughs>